to provide you a clean airplane, we will now collect any items you wish to discard, including newspapers, bags, cups, or any items on the floor or in seatback pockets. We recycle aluminum cans where possible. Thanks for your help. From a distance, our world is a very beautiful and peaceful place. But as you look closer, you can see overwhelming pain and suffering. We're so familiar with the scenes of devastation and poverty in the media, but some really grab our attention. Devastation in Haiti, where thousands are dead. After a powerful earthquake, the worst for 200 years. Buildings collapse, trapping unknown numbers of people. Hundreds of thousands are in desperate need of the very basics of survival. Food, water, shelter, and in many cases, medical attention. The devastation in Haiti that claimed the lives of over 230,000 people was not simply a natural disaster. It was caused by generations of extreme poverty that left the country vulnerable and unable to cope. The first time I visited Haiti was in 1975, and ever since I've been moved by the suffering in the world. Sometimes poverty seems overwhelming and makes you wonder if we will ever bring it to an end. But as a Christian, Isaiah 58 compels me to stand against injustice, help the broken-hearted, and feed the hungry. In this film, we will discover incredible and unexpected reasons for hope. We will meet some extraordinary people who battle with poverty every day. And we explore what it really means to live 58. better to begin the journey of exploring Isaiah 58 than the Holy Land. What do you think is the message of Isaiah 58 for today's church? In the chapter 58 we know that there is a great concern about the way religion has been practiced and unless you really care for the oppressed and for the poor then you are not really doing God's will, you're not really doing God's work you're not really being faithful to the God of justice. I don't think there's a place on earth that more demonstrates God's identification with the poor or his heart for the poor and the oppressed than Bethlehem. All through the scripture, God had made it so very clear the importance of the poor to him and uh, what, what better way to demonstrate that than to say, my son is going to be born in poverty. Can you understand how precious they are to me? Can you understand how high I hold them in my esteem? Do you understand how much I care? And ultimately, he is going to be your redemption. He is going to be your savior. Do you understand why you need to, to ultimately care?
ቤም ላን እንጂሩ ክለስ ለወ አማ ረክን ማጅረ ካቢ ትረክነ ማለ ማንቃ አማ ከተንታ ይዮና ማርከ ተገብደ አማ ረክነ ጉዳንቃ አራንታ ናይቹ The people living in this part of Ethiopia haven't seen decent rain in years. The scorched earth, the starving cattle, the failing crops are all signs of their daily struggle for survival. For the most part, this community is untouched by the outside world. Life goes on as best it can in this remote, desolate place. Kids play, families live, work and struggle side by side. In Wakitu's struggle to provide for her family, she and her 11-year-old daughter Taji get up very early and head out into the countryside. They walk for hours to find dry wood they can sell. It's their only source of income, and as time goes on, there's less and less available, so they have to walk further and further. One day there'll be none left. It's a tough job. physically demanding work in immense heat especially considering that Wakitu is 7 months pregnant amma demetu ko batsana qorasan baachu dadabe harren kawo shigirame kana fa bakkar tenebo hasila hojja waqati warni godan injirtu akmu ombi obgol sayille godemo koruen jeetani mo nafse sadade ya rabbi suma beka je ይሄኝ <laughs> ደምኔ ጉርጉሬ ገና ገለ ብሎቄ ቢኒ አፈለ Wakito and Taji have to walk 6 kilometers into the local town to sell the wood they have collected just to buy water and bread Wakitu has very little but she does have the support of those around her and this is one of the beautiful things about her community walking around we experienced a real sense of togetherness and concern for each other there's something incredibly special about this something that we have all but lost in the west <laughs> ጋሩ <laughs> ረካዴ ታንኬቻ ባይ ነረት ጅጌጄ ታን ጅጌት ጆልን አርከት ፍጠጄ ታን መናኬቻ ባይ ረክነን ቀባ ወነላ ዱፍ ዳቤ ታን አርከን ይትጃራ አብቀበኛ ዳቤ ታን ረክና ጅኤ መና ባይ ዋኛ ታና ባኒ ታ ፍሮ ዴሲ መና ባይ ነረት ምን ኩፍተ ጆልን አፍጥጄ ታን ካይ ባይ ባይ ዋኒ ጫምና ነን ሞ ካመና በደን ጄ አስገራ ጋለ ዋኒ ጫምና ረክነ ጉዳ ራይ መና ባይ አማ ዋኛ ታን ቀበ ረክነ መና ና ባስ one of the very heartbreaking thing that uh, i live with is uh, when i see people in rural areas 
being buried before they start living. In a way, this is really a true description of what it means to live in rural Ethiopia. Many of these intelligent people die before their potential is out. Hard as it is for us to understand, these people have no choice but to cut down the trees to sell for charcoal. They know that this is destroying the environment and their hopes for crops in the future. But with nothing for today, how can they plan for tomorrow? It's a matter of life and death. Afana matis la toetan ofitis are biumain ba shigirim barayu man tara nan dabarto juletias gatetan biaba jetan namati wai hima. Mali bogof ka Jesus Kristo paisa da. Hippa itas dibe tanasi danja inastere napa ye nagamba de fa wagayu prate wanta. Humana jalamban. Nagamati se gurta. There is deep determination at the government level, at the church level, and also in the hearts and minds of individuals to reverse what we have been known for. We now want Ethiopia to be known as a country that is able to feed its people, to provide decent standard of living. The time is now ready, the time has come. It is like we all have one heart now, one mind, one determination to bring about a complete change. The church has to spirit that change. Many like Wakitu, the constant struggle for survival eventually compels them to move into big cities. It's often a desperate measure, a one-way ticket to a slum that exposes them to even greater risk. <laughs> Originally from a rural district in Kenya, Alice and her husband moved to the capital Nairobi with the hope of finding jobs and an easier way of life. But what she found far from met her expectations. Madari Valley is a place where 700,000 to 800,000 people live. There's crime, there's a lot of dire poverty. We have a problem of drugs and drunkenness or hopelessness is a place where life can be very fast and short. This is the place that is called Madare. I wanna die. 
in the area, let me say, most of the people are alcoholics because you are desperate to live. You have to depend on, yani, to forget your problems, you have to drink. Yeah, you forget your problems, you go to sleep, tomorrow is another day. Yeah, that's how, that's the cry of the day. Down by the river, an illegal brewery produces a local drink known as Changa, a dangerous and addictive concoction that can cause mental health problems, blindness, even death. While the industry fuels the local economy, it destroys lives. This is gang territory, violent, oppressive and dangerous. This is the solution of sugar and water. When it evaporates, it, it, comes, it comes like this. <laughs> and this is condensation. This is what? Condensation. And it comes, it is pure. African wine. Yes, pure African wine. Hey, Chip. So why why do you make this alcohol? This alcohol is the one we we sell in our in our village. And do people like it? Yes. Why do they drink it? They drink it because of uh, depression, lack of money, because it is cheap. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. is done by the, the children, children mostly, before they, they graduate into taking the hard drugs. It's much more affordable for people who don't have money. So the children take the glue. They sniff it the whole day through. You find a child with a bottle, they get drunk, and it slows them in the brain. Alice works selling vegetables and fruit. She finds the produce in the dump of a local market. She takes the produce back to the valley, cleans it up and sells it on the side of the road. What is not good enough to sell, she feeds to her family. As in many places like this around the world, there are heroes at work, deeply committed to making life easier and more hopeful. Pastor Joel does an incredible work helping the poor. The kind of living that is uh, lived in these uh, shanties is, um, is, is very bad. It's very bad and um, people live closely together. There are people who, most of them, who cannot afford a meal. Uh, you know, it may be only a very simple meal per day, which is also a poor nutrition. And uh, the living here, the living, the living has brought people to turn almost to animal-like living. You can never maintain a sense of dignity where you have no toilet, where you have no decent place where you can even wash yourself, even take a bath. Careful. You are okay now. Yes, sir. It's quite rough here. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I tell you, this garbage here is a mixture of anything. Anything. Including uh, waste from, uh, from hospitals and uh, many other things you cannot mention. They're just inside here. 
Yani nama kwa nama kera kagi nyama ra kwa inyo kuhote ha ha hayo raga niki ni warua re odai kwa yote na warua ni mai mau masi ni. These humble homes are stacked together, hot, dark, and very small. Sadly, most days Alice is unable to feed her children breakfast. Instead, they drink black tea with a bit of sugar. Visiting Mathari is a harrowing experience. Here I feel the urgency that as God's people, the church simply cannot stand by whilst people live in this way. Amazing west to be walking here in this very Mount of Olives. I mean, this this very location is where Jesus was overcome with grief as he looked across at Jerusalem and couldn't help himself. He just wept over the city. This is a setting where uh, he actually spoke this incredible, powerful teaching in Matthew chapter 25 about the kingdom of heaven. He says, and so when the Son of Man comes in all of his glory, I mean, the sky is split open, and we're told that all the nations of the earth are going to gather before him. Then the king is going to separate one from the other. And when this huge process is done, then the king is going to say, now this is what this was all about. It's what the prophets have talked about. It's how I lived my life. It is what my scriptures are filled with, 2,000 verses about this. It should come as no surprise. This is about the poor, how extremely important they are to me. And he will have separated them by what, not what did you think, not what did you pray about, what were you concerned about, but what did you actually do? And so this powerful passage was taught on this location, in this beautiful scenery. And the bottom line message is, the poor really, really matter to me. And those of us who are followers of Christ, we simply don't have the option when it comes to the poor of doing nothing. And this is the message of God for us today, that God is a God of love, God who loves all people equally. And that when we see one person hurting and oppressed, then I am oppressed if I don't do anything about it. And when we are looking at our friends in the West, affluent people in affluent societies, they also have a responsibility. Despite the wealth that dominates so much of the West, many still struggle to balance their finances. Kirsty is a young teacher and dressmaker from the UK. She told us how issues of self-esteem and materialism have often been a challenge for her, to the point that she found herself caught into a debt that she couldn't pay off. I built up a lot of debt over the years. I've always struggled with handling my money. I remember when I got paid my first job when I was 16 and blew my paycheck within the first day. And I remember that feeling of getting to a point where it was all out of control and I'd wake up either in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning and have that sick feeling of how am I ever going to get out of this? But the majority of it was spent on trying to alter or improve my image. But I went to university in the centre of London um, and I went to fashion college and that was by far the biggest challenge. 
is I wanted to not so much fit in, but I wanted to have the right image. And I did have low self-esteem, and I just felt that everything was centred around what I looked like. And that was where I placed my hope in me and my future was in those things. Kirsty made a decision to change her life. She began by cutting up her credit cards one Sunday in front of her church and now is opening her eyes to a bigger world. In cutting down on some of my spend, I've been able to free up some money to be able to support others. And I was determined to open up my eyes a little bit more and broaden my perspective. I had the opportunity to go to Kenya to see some of the work that my church are involved with. And we came and arrived at the church and we met Pastor Joel and his team and he started to show us around the community and, and talk about the work that they're doing there. So where are we going down to now? Mm. This is our river. Mm. It's a dead river. You don't find anything that lives there, not even a frog, because it's very much contaminated. Yeah. Mm. No, not even germs. Sometimes we joke that not even germs can live in our river. <laughs> because it's too toxic. Kirsty's local church has connected with the work of Pastor Joel and his church in the Mathari Valley, proving fruitful for both sides. For the UK church, the link has become a focus for prayer and an opportunity for them to engage. For the church in Mathari, the support is a great source of encouragement. The church is a source of hope and inspiration for many in the congregation and also in the community at large. We have things like um, the malnourished children that we work with, bringing them to the church kitchen and feeding them with a well-balanced diet and teaching their parents how to feed these children. We want to keep the young people busy with some activities. For example, we teach them the guitar, teach them the piano, there's a dance troupe. We have several of them in the Sunday school. We also have football, and they go up to national level in competition. That kind of interaction and good positive uh, usage of their energy. We also have vocational training for the young people and also for the women, that they can learn some simple skills that they can be able to improve their lives. One of the people that I met was a lovely lady called Anastasia and she uh, was working on the side of the road and she talked a bit about her life as a single mum living in this place and the sewing business is her income and she's known as a local designer and she has people bring stuff to her and she fixes them or she makes things from scratch and she talked about being in a place where there's so many challenges of trying to make ends meet but also doing a job that she clearly loves. That one conversation which lasted 15 minutes was one of the most powerful conversations I've had with somebody. There was me out there thinking, oh, what can I do to help? And I think we often think that we can go to these places and think, what can we do to help? But there's an, a massive amount that they can help us with. And I saw people that were in strife and, and had no money and were you know, really struggling to make ends meet, but had hope. And they were placing their hope in God. And all this time, I've been placing my hope in things. Their faith is so much stronger, yet they had virtually nothing. And there was me with virtually everything around me, and my faith wasn't where it should have been. For me, the blessing that I've had and that I am having is that my relationship with him is growing deeper and deeper and stronger and stronger. I can look through the years and see God can make a change in somebody's life. Where I am, I am right now, I am a testimony in the valley. I was born to a home where we were uh, 16 children. During that time, my mother used to brew uh, local brew so to, to, to get food for us. I used to smoke, used to drink, used to fight a lot. I wanted somebody to stop me from doing what I was doing. Since I received Christ, I was able to go to school uh, even moved out of, of the valley. But the Lord now called me from all that I was doing to come back to the valley and give hope to the children. Tell them it can be done. If you come to Christ, it's possible to change your life. And uh, we have seen it happening. Uh, I'm always talking to them and telling them, guys, I'm just one of you. 
just one of you. It has happened to me. It can happen to you too. Sadly for many young people, the absence of good role models means they get into violent gangs, which are fueled by social deprivation and poverty. A questão da sociedade, a questão da, 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 das comunidades como essa aqui, a droga é mais frequente. Então as crianças elas já veem isso mais cedo. E por ver mais cedo, é, qualquer desilusão, qualquer atrapalho de vida, eles vão conseguir, vão usar e vão talvez navegar sem, sem ter uma volta. Auri was once a feared gang member and paid assassin in Brazil, who took many drugs and spent every day of his life in fear. Faço parte dessa comunidade onde eu passei muitos anos da minha vida até a fundação dessa comunidade, onde eu fiz meu primeiro barraco aqui e passei um bom tempo vivendo no tráfico, onde guardava as armas, onde guardava drogas e até chegar ao outro lado. But Auri found Christ and now helps other addicts to come off drugs and escape from the gang culture working deep in communities dominated by dangerous gangs. He's inspiring those around him to see that they too can change their lives. É, o nosso contato dentro da comunidade é aquele contato que consiste de uma amizade. Uma amizade qual não impomos o evangelho, não impomos o próprio Deus, um bate-papo, uma tranquilidade, em busca de que, entendendo que depois, lá na frente, ele vai analisar nossa vida, como está hoje, e vai questionar. Como é que vocês chegaram até isso? O que foi que aconteceu com vocês? A nossa ideia hoje, como comunidade, é viver a igreja de Atos, uma igreja que veio para fora. Nosso grupo tem se preocupado de se vestir como eles, andar como eles, não surge uma barreira. Então, ao se identificar, eles se abrem porque todo, todo indivíduo que esteja traficando, usuário, vivendo como usuário ou até assassinando, vingando algo, ele tem o um desejo de se libertar e sair disso. E o grupo que eu ando e o grupo que eu estou incluído é esse, que para sobreviver precisava de uma arma de fogo, precisava tirar bem. Então, para mim, hoje, é a palavra de Deus que é a minha, a minha arma, não só para me manter vivo, mas também para dar vida. Preparado para nós, Senhor Deus. Chuva, sol, o que vier, Senhor Deus, é um clima, Senhor Deus, preparado por Ti, Senhor Deus. E agradecemos porque olhamos para o céu e vimos o Senhor Deus. Deep in the jungles of southern India, the Mudwa tribe live in the trees to avoid being trampled by wild elephants. Whilst the setting looks simply idyllic, with lack of food or clean water, no medical care, deadly flying snakes and poisonous spiders, this tribe are struggling to survive. ഞങ്ങളെ <laughs> അപ്പൊ അതിന് പണത് വന്നാൽ അത് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് കിട്ടുന്ന കൂലി ഇത്രക്കല്ലേ ഉള്ളൂ പത്തോ മുപ്പത് രൂപ പത്തോ നൂറ് രൂപ കൂലി വെച്ച് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് കിട്ടുന്നു ഇവിടെ ജീവിക്കാൻ മാർക്കല്ലാതെ വരുന്നു കൊണ്ടാണ് ഞങ്ങൾ പോകുന്നത് അഭിപ്രായം നമ്മൾ പോയി കഴിഞ്ഞ് വല്ല കാശുകൾ മുതൽ സമ്പാദിക്കാന്നുള്ള ഒരു കണക്കൂട്ടൽ പോകുന്നു മാത്രമേ നല്ല വിഷമമുണ്ട് പോകാതിരിക്കാൻ നിലവാരമില്ല ഇവിടെ ജീവിക്കാൻ മാർക്കമില്ല നേരത്തെ പോലെ കൂകുത്താനും പിടിക്കാനും കിട്ടാനും ഇല്ല 
പിന്നെ തെള്ളി തേനും അതും കിട്ടാനില്ല ദാരിദ്ര്യം കൊണ്ടാണ് With no money or education, many people who move to the cities from places like the jungle in India resort to borrowing money in order to survive. In doing this, they often end up in quarries, brick factories or sweatshops, trapped into bonded labor systems. ിയർലി <laughs> initially they don't realize that that is a trap vadding kadapula modukad mudila avanga enna pannanga ena romba thoru kodutanga na unala mudiyum mudiyada avanga enna romba idha pannanga adanal ena enga engalum seri seri anga vaapa indha oru indha indha oru vaapa nadava neenga vaange na adu adu adaram kattila pannanga seri adanal inga vandu adaram vaangana idhu vaanga katta So will will he ever be able to live without being in debt? Yenak and Nambigila sir anuk. Ama Nambigila. Bonded labor is one of the most shocking outcomes of poverty. It enslaves people like Sanjeev and Shivama and their families. Their total debt amounts to only about $600, but they will never be able to pay it back. It will be passed on to their children and their children's children. There's simply no escape. Work in the quarry starts early. Sanjeev and his family get up in the early hours of the morning to prepare their tools alongside the other quarry workers. Patta mela sambala suddam eduthe ala therundana sibudu edundala nambara ishtam. Adha seri na sutturadhukku oral anga uli eduthu tharadhukku nalla arpai poru oral nalla nalla palaka vechi andha oral thatti poi poru. Adhe eduthu innoru patalla. Ipa இந்த மாதிரி தட்டி உளியல தட்டி சமிட்டல தட்டி முடிச்சதனால ஆ உளியல கொஞ்சம் ஆறணும் ஆறணும் ஆறنا போனா பாறி தூக்கி போணும் Sanjeev and his family work in the blazing heat cutting breaking and collecting the granite rocks it's backbreaking work that can often result in injury quarry workers have been injured and finally 
they are into lot of problems. So if he falls sick and again he has to take another loan from the quarry owner and again the debt also gets raised day by day. If he is not able to work in the quarry because of his old age or ill health or injury, the quarry owners will not leave them. Their wife or daughter or son will be caught into this. Sir, in our middle, na, we are Samsung order, na. You jala, jala order, sir, order, karan karte. Puri honga. Sir, you weed karta, madam sirla. Na, you da weed karna, madam sirla. You was smart, na. You on order, sir, order, sir, na, ni karan karte. Amar puri honga. Unal pata, marta un kaap na da. Amar chya pate. Marta pordan sir, jaadi adam la. Yeng puli na orna ka. நாலு பேர் கிளம்ப இல்லாம பரு எல்லாரும் படிக்கிறாங்க போயிடுறாங்க எங்கால மூட்டு ஏன் படிக்க முடியல பணக்காரமா முடிய மாட்டாங்க ஆனால் தான் சரி எல்லாரும் படிக்கிறாங்களே ஏன் நான் புள்ளி போக முடியல அப்படின்னா அதே கவலை தான் வேறு கவலை இல்லை மற்றவங்க என்ன பணக்காரலாம் அந்த மாதிரி இல்லை யோ என்ன எவ்வளோ இருக்குது அப்படியாங்க அப்படி கெஞ்சி இது வாங்கிட்டு போனேன் வாங்கிட்டு போய் தான் நான் குடும்பம் பண்ணேன் அப்படி இருந்தால் எப்படி நிம்மதியாக இருக்குது உங்களுக்கு முடியாது திரும்ப பணம் இருந்தால் எல்லாம் நிமித்தம் தான் இங்கே எதுவும் இல்லையே திங்க சாப்பாடு வரல அப்போ எப்படி திரும்பி இருக்கு You can ask God for anything. What would you ask for? Mitai vanu ke pya. Kadul pa, ha? Mitai. Ha, na. Sahi kala. Naala ella sandoshama irukana. Enna anthana panna ide vala da seiyna. Paase endha mattum onna adu apdi aagana. Illa na indha vela pannite naanga pinna apdi aagurtha. This is something that we've seen all over the world. When children get around 12 years old, their childlike energy and innocence disappears. Every father will have a dreams about their own children. But unfortunately, all those dreams are built in the sky, in the cloud. It is not a reality. That is the heart cry of a quarry worker. When I say that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, when I see these sort of a misery happening here, I can't be indifferent to it. In the Bible, Jesus has said a parable called as parable of a good Samaritan, where a man was wounded and he was lying on the roadside. I view this quarry worker as something like that man lying down, dying without any help. And as a Christian, I would like to be a good Samaritan to them and the church has to be a good Samaritan to them. Just look at this, what a spectacular place this is. This is the exact location that Jesus had in his mind when he told the story of the, the Good Samaritan uh, recorded in Luke chapter 10. I mean, he knew when he said there was a man on the road 
from Jerusalem to Jericho that everyone would conjure up this stark, sort of terrifying, desolate place. To be compassionate, to be that kind of Samaritan, it takes some risk. It takes courage to be compassionate. Uh, this man didn't know as he stopped to help this wounded man that the thieves weren't lurking, ready to pounce on him as well. To be compassionate in a hurting world means it's going to cost something. It cost this good Samaritan time. He interrupted his whole journey. It cost him money. He said, and Jesus even told exactly how much money, two silver coins. Uh, he said, you take care of it. Maybe this will help, but I'll pay the rest of it when I come. And probably most important, it cost him a big chunk of his heart because he had to enter into this man's ugly trauma. He had to get his hands bloody. He had to risk rejection. It cost him a big piece of his own heart. That is our Lord. And he ends the story with those incredibly powerful words, go and do the same thing. Back in the quarry, the local church are doing what they can to alleviate the extreme poverty among the workers and their families. This includes supporting women and mothers, a particularly vulnerable group. We teach them some of the income generation skills, immunization, cleanliness, hygiene. And we also say that a mother should be taught how to take care of the babies. And most important thing we say that you're not alone. Number one, God is with you. And as a community of God's children, we are with you. Now they are very happy and they say that, yes, it is worth living with Jesus Christ. And slowly, one by one, they started coming to the Lord. Samuel and his team have also set up a project for children to look after basic needs like health care, education and nutrition. For many quarry workers trapped in bonded labour, this brings enormous hope. Custom and the number of the number of Pulay and Kuarakuda. Number Pulla, Padikipo, the Nala, Paravala, the Sarichal Nala support Pandi, Padiku Iranga. Pulla Nala Padikiranga, Nuth and Tonuthi and Market together. Pulla Nama Nala Padiku and Urasa, Pulla Naka, number is top. Nala Padiku and Pulla.
ದೇವ್ ನನಗೆ ಆಶೀರ್ವಾದ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಮೀಸ್ ಈ ಥರ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಬಾರ್ದು ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿ ಓದಬೇಕು ತಂದೆ ತಾಯಿಗಳಿಗೆ ತುಂಬ Because of the help she's receiving from the church in her community, Saundaria will avoid a future in bonded labor. But it also protects her from another horrific threat, the sex trade. This is one of the greatest evils today, a global industry worth an estimated 32 billion dollars. It destroys the lives of the most vulnerable of all, children in poverty. the families from which these girls come from are extremely poor it just makes it easier for the traffickers because they know they are in need they know the families are in need and if they can tell them that okay one i will marry you two i will find you a job you can help your family better somewhere in the back of the mind the family knows that this is not going to happen she's not going to get a job really but again the fact that they're getting the money and that she's going to send them more money back they allow the daughters to go We met a former US Marine and undercover drug officer with the LAPD who turned down a comfortable retirement in California in order to join the fight against the sex trade in Calcutta. I organize a, a team of field workers that go out into the field every day and look for victims of trafficking, young girls who have been tricked or taken against their will and held in these evil places. We try and come up with ways of rescuing them, ways of finding them, and ways of building relationships with high-level police officials that we need to do our job. When you go into one of these places, an overwhelming sense of darkness just falls on you. You know that you're going into a world of evil. Business is very brisk. There's lots of money being exchanged. There are lots of customers coming in, going out. There are lots of ladies waiting to be taken. These young girls, they're not only forced to do this work, but they're forced to believing that this is what they need to do in order to support their families. Investigators and the national staff that, that work in on our team are some of the bravest individuals I've met in my life. They're brave in a very real way every single day. They go into places where we don't go. They go into places without a envelope of protection surrounding them other than God. And they go into environments where they know that everything is working against them. And they know that they have to uh take a risk uh, because there's no other way to do it. You have to go to where the victims are to find them. And so they do it. and they do it willingly and they do it prayerfully they don't do it for the money there's no pride involved in it they don't get to tell the world what they're doing you know they don't even tell the people in the community what they're doing because their lives are at stake these traffickers kill people these traffickers uh beat people to death we think it is possible to put an end to this there are already several organizations who are involved in identifying and rescuing and rehabilitating girls in this situation if we don't stand up to an evil practice like this it will just carry on and i think it is high time for the church at large to realize this and give these girls hope give these girls true freedom so that they will not have to be abused another day. But I've been in the military. I've been in combat for 22 years, been in gun battles, been in shootings, been in knockdown drag out fights, very stressful undercover situations and I will tell you this is the hardest job I've ever done. The hardest. These last 2 years have been the hardest things, the hardest challenges. Dangers are very real, the stress is very real, the problems are huge. But here's the thing. I felt more used to advance God's kingdom than anything I've ever done in the past. If there's one thing I could tell people, find the hard things that God calls you to and do them. Cuz there is a uh, there's nothing better in life, I feel, than uh, than having God build you up for a purpose and being used for that purpose.
I don't know how to convince people. I don't know that they have to leave home to do it, but I think we'll find the joy and peace that surpasses all understanding. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Nothing. This has been the best decision of my life. Jesus was riding this amazing wave of approval when he comes to his hometown in Nazareth. And they're so excited to have him here, they said, Jesus, do the, do the scriptures, read this for us. And they hand to him the book of Isaiah. So he could have read anything in that entire book, but he chooses to read Isaiah chapter 61 and verses one and two. And this is what he read. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. A verse and a half, he rolls up the scroll, he hands it back to the attendant and he sits down and all eyes are on him and he says nothing. And they're like, Two verses, that's all you're going to read? And I would look at it and say, if you had just read half of that chapter, the rest of it is all about joy and hope. You could have, they would have carried you out of the synagogue on their shoulders as their hometown hero. But you chose to stop at the end of the hard stuff. And then he speaks and he says, this day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And upon saying that, he made his choice. He chose to align himself with the prisoner and with the poor, with the blind and with the oppressed. And it was an important fork in the road that he took that day. And uh, it led ultimately to the cross. There are many ways to get involved in tackling issues of poverty and injustice. We've come to the U.S. state of Georgia, where a coffee shop is modeling a fresh way of doing business. Wake Up Coffee is committed to giving some of its profits to charity. It sells fair trade products, guaranteeing a fair wage for producers and artisans overseas. It's even become an advocate in the area for issues of poverty and oppression. One of the biggest impacts we have on, on fighting poverty is we're a fair trade shop. We definitely believe in the principles behind fair trade. We believe in uh, alleviating child slavery. Uh, we believe in, in using environmentally sustainable practices uh, in all the products that we sell. Another way is we give a portion of our profits every month. This is a new company. We're not able to give as much money as we would prefer, but what we are able to do is we're able to be a hub for a lot of organizations that are trying to, to fight things globally. One of the biggest things that we as believers can do to, to fight poverty is, first of all, I think we can educate ourselves and to be aware. It just broadens our perspective. It lets us understand what God's doing globally. And when we do that, we realize that the way uh, that we live here in a Western culture is very, very, very different than the way the rest of the world functions. And so for us, there's no greater opportunity than to model something different and something unique. You know, the Bible does say that they'll know us by the way we live our lives and the way we treat one another. And so if we're living this countercultural life, what a great opportunity for people to notice something that's totally different about us. With entrepreneurs like Bowman actively getting involved in issues of justice, fasting some of their profits, and strategically linking with people in poor communities, change is taking place. We used to say that 40,000 children die every day from hunger and preventable diseases. And now we're at 21,000 per day. We've cut in half the number of children who are dying of preventable causes before their fifth birthday. And one of the reasons for that progress is that these kids now have access to clean drinking water. Did you know that just since 1990, 600 million people have gained access to safe drinking water. Hmm? 
Another major killer of children around the world is malaria. In six years, between 2002 and 2008, in that six year span, 22 countries have cut their malaria rate in half. And they did it through simple interventions. They did it through insecticide treated nets and better medicines and spraying to kill mosquitoes, things that can be done and are being done. In my first born, I had difficulties with malaria. They gave me two pair of nets. I was very happy, very happy, because I would use one for the kids, the other one for mine. And I thank God, even they taught us to treat that net. We are making incredible progress, but if you're only going to remember one thing from all this stuff that I'm telling you, please remember this. In the span of a generation, we have cut in half the percentage of people living in extreme economic poverty. The question is, what's it going to take to get to zero? World-renowned economists have said that $73 billion per year over a span of 10 years is what it will take to end extreme poverty. And now that might seem like a lot of money, but when you compare it to the $2.5 trillion that God has given just North American Christians, I'm not talking about all the Christians around the world, I'm talking about those of us who attend church regularly and say our faith is very important to us here in the United States, $2.5 trillion compared to that 73 billion is nothing. We have been given everything we need. God has given us everything we need to end extreme poverty. It's amazing to think that our resources can make such a difference to the poor. But money isn't the only answer. The church has a powerful voice which we can use to bring about change. In Ethiopia, the church has lobbied solidly for environmental causes, to protect the landscape and hopes for the future. Now it has brought government and religious groups together to plant trees and set aside green spaces. Where we are standing now is a good example of what happens when the church partners and cooperates with local governments. Things like this, I mean planting trees, water supply, caring for needy children and elderly, the church taking the lead and then the government coming and working and cooperating with the church. The thing we have seen here can be replicated all over the world and the church can actually play its role as uh, indicated in Isaiah 58, repairing the broken walls, whether it is a broken wall of the environment broken wall of uh, relationship, and then broken walls of uh, production, the church can actually play a significant role. Campaigning against unjust systems that oppress the poor has always been a vital part of the church's heritage. Holy Trinity Clapham in London was the spiritual home of William Wilberforce and the Clapham Saints, who campaigned for the end of the slave trade almost 200 years ago. Christian faith is inseparable from concern for the poor, whether you're talking about Wilberforce or indeed whether you're talking about the movement under Martin Luther King Jr. in the States, or whether you're talking about Desmond Tutu and apartheid in South Africa, just to name a few. The church has always been at its best leading the way in speaking up for the oppressed. And I think the voice of God, the spirit of Isaiah 58, is constantly reminding us that God will not allow any kind of barricades between us and his concerns for the poor. So get rid of your sacrifices, get rid of the kind of fasting which oppresses the poor, get rid of your theological conundrums which creates obstacles between my passion for the poor and the needs of the poor, and revise your politics if you need to. This isn't a radical message. We're talking about radically requiring Christians to be 1% more generous. I mean, that's what you're talking about. You get into financial terms here. There's nothing radical being asked of Christians. It's align your heart with God, feel what he feels over the preventable suffering and death caused by extreme poverty, and then move out of that heart. Let his spirit move you to use the resources that he's given you to advance his purposes in the world. Understanding that it is possible to end extreme poverty 
and that we have the very resources at our fingertips. It's exciting to visit churches where they don't simply believe this, they live it out. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and... I'd say about 70% of our kids come from unchurched homes. And most of those homes, um, they're probably living on welfare. They're living in just poor neighborhoods. It's not just them, they're two brothers and parents that live in the house. They probably have their grandmother and their, their grandfather and their aunts and uncles and cousins and they all live in maybe a two bedroom apartment. But yet, when it's time for them to be at church, they're, they're giving everything they have. In the heart of Queens, New York, is Christ's Tabernacle. It's a church actively reaching out to the poor, both locally and further afield. As a church, on Wednesday, we all decided to fast one meal, whether it be breakfast, lunch, or dinner, in a fast for global hunger, to pray for those people who don't have a meal, you know, the less fortunate. When we ask our kids to fast and pray for the poor, it was really um, a place of the poor fasting for the poor. And they're, they're willing to give up everything they have because they know that God is calling them to do this. I would love to see world hunger come to an end because some teenagers in a poor neighborhood decided to fast for some people that were poorer than them. So what would you say to churches doing nothing for the poor? Wow. Get to work. Get to work. <laughs> Because that's, that's what we're here for. What we understand is that the practical is just as spiritual as the fast and as the prayer. Um, when you meet somebody where they're at uh, and you meet their needs, they're going to turn around and they're going to ask, well, why do you do this for me? They're pretty passionate about it, so. So passionate. So passionate because it's why we exist as the church. Just showing up for our meetings isn't enough. We actually have to get out there. That's why in the beginning of Isaiah, uh, the, the prophecy comes through and he says, I'm tired of your meetings. Some of you have been calling out to God for so long and you've been wondering why he hasn't responded because he wanted you to step out, put your own insecurities, doubts, hurts and pain aside and fight someone else's battle. Go on somebody else's behalf and pray for them because he promises if you pray for them, then he will meet you. If you go to meet somebody else with the stuff that they're dealing with, you will see his glory come forth in your own life. We have to be different. We have to think differently, feel differently, see things differently, and therefore those of us following Christ, we have to act differently. We know the power of our faith. We know that we can move mountains. We know that, that if we're bold and, and act out the way that God's called us to live, that, that we can change things. When we wake up to that reality that extreme poverty can be eradicated from earth, we will become indignant. I don't know how to convince people to get out of their comfort zone that I lived in for so long. But I mean it when I say that. I wouldn't change my decision for anything. Now is the time to bring an end to the brutality of extreme poverty. It's time to say this stops with us. Join the unprecedented alliance of Christians worldwide and discover how you can live 58. God is going to use us to change the course of history. Set the captives free. 
you shall go free. Shout it aloud and don't hold back. Shout it aloud and don't hold back. Now is the time to bring true praise. Shout it aloud and don't hold back. Shout it aloud and don't hold back. Now is the time to bring true praise. Come to make a charm. 